Thinking about mobility, there's maybe almost no area of our lives which has changed more drastically over the past years. A developed country is not a place where poor have access to cars, it's a place where rich use public transport and I think it's very, very true. So there's going to be this whole sub subset of people who are not that skilled, who live in the countryside and who are not at the places where all this technological change and at the forefront of these things, they're not, hap they're not there anymore, uh, they're going to be left behind. I think, um, for example, with autonomous cars, ethic um, thoughts and considerations are really important and I think countries have to develop frameworks. I'm not completely sure about this whole concept that transportation will become completely a service and nobody wants to own cars anymore because, um, yeah, I, don't, I think that doesn't take into account the human mentality well enough. Thank you, um, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Future is always exciting, but I think it also creates a lot of anxiety, and we've seen in the, uh, since yesterday, there are a lot of questions about what's gonna work, what is not going to work, what's good for us, what's not good for us. So this session uh, in plenary is special because we will talk about the future of transport and, of course, robotics. Um, let's uh, begin by introducing our panelists. Um, on my left uh, is Mr. Wolf Henning Scheider, he's the Chief Executive Officer of ZF. Wolin Gaua, Director, Design Center, Beijing Electric Vehicle Company, and Dirk Albon, Co-Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. So what is the future of, of transportation? Um, I think I have to begin with you, Dirk. Are we going to all be put into this tiny little capsule and shot through Earth? Is that what we are going to be uh, looking forward to? No, there's so much wrong with your statement that, uh, you know, <laughs> they're not tiny little capsules. They're actually more similar to, let's say, an airplane fuselage, right? You're not being shot because it's, um, it needs to be something that works for a two-year-old as much as for an 80-year-old. So actually, it's more similar to, um, you know, what you already know from a train. You don't feel speed. You only feel acceleration and deceleration, and that's something that we can modify. And um, I think the most important part is actually that the experience is great, um, you know, besides just being fast. Have you tried it? <laughs> no, not yet, but we're working on it. But this is, this is the idea which has, you know, enthralled everybody. Everybody's imagination is captured by the thought of, of a completely new system of transportation, which uh, is, is uh, already being implemented, the ideas, you're doing it in developing countries, you're doing it in, in, in developed markets. Um, how do you see this becoming critical? Do you see this happening in five years, in 10 years? What is the vision of Hyperloop? So the technology already exists. We have been working uh, on integrating the technology now over the last five years. At this time, we're ready to build version number one. Of course, you know, as a company that um, is working mostly on innovation and technology, there's going to be several other versions. We already know that we can do better than what it is today in the future. Um, but there's a big hurdle, and the hurdle is regulations. It's a system that doesn't exist so far. It's not a train, it's not an, it's not an airplane. So you need to create a completely new set of laws and rules. And um, that's what we're doing as well. So we're working with Munich Re, for example, which is the largest reinsurance company in the world, to work on the insurance of the system. We're working with TÜV on the safety guidelines. Um, that's very important. But on the other hand, it's also not only about going at just below the speed of sound inside the tube. Uh, we have the unique opportunity to build a transportation system the way it should be in 2018, right? Travel sucks. <laughs> Nobody enjoys traveling anymore. And um, we don't have those limits that are set today. We can reimagine what it means. How do you build a transportation system if today there would be none? How would it look? How would it be paid for? Um, how would the experience be? And um, that's exactly what we're doing. So, you know, there's a lot more exciting things to come, I think. So. Staying with you for a moment, Hyperloop could possibly do three things, between countries, between cities, within cities. What is the target that you are looking at? Is, is there a plan or do you let it evolve as people start using it? 
Well, you know, realistically, you start with the things that are a little bit faster, so shorter distances first. Um, just because we depend heavily on politicians. They're Don't we all? <laughs> yeah. Well, the problem is that they are not around for a long time, right? They're there for four years. So um, in some countries, it's different. Um, but you, you really need to make sure that you can deliver within the time frame, ideally. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, we're looking into shorter distances first. And then, of course, they will be connected to other longer lines. Um, but the first, the most important thing is really creating those r regulations that's necessary in order to really bring it into commercialization. I think that's important because you also have to t earn the trust of the potential users. Uh, Wulin, I'll come to you. Electric vehicles, we are far more comfortable with. Um, we know what electric vehicles are. And, and in China, I think there's a huge revolution underway in terms of usage of electric vehicles. What is the vision of your company? Um, my company um, is, um, we, we call Baik Group, means uh, my, our mother company Baik is producing the uh, combustion vehicles. And now uh, my company BGEV is established seven years ago. So we are producing only the EV vehicles. We have two types of the vehicles. So one is, you know, it converts from combustion vehicles to EV. Another one is a totally new brand we called ArcFox, which is producing totally new platform only dedicated to EV cars. Mm -hmm. So we are looking that, uh, you know, EV cars, um, um, how do you say, to be promoted for daily use, uh, because our company is already announced in two, by 2020, we will stop uh, to produce the combustion cars, you know, engine cars. So. Um, but on the other hand, uh, from the industry point of view, you know, in China currently, there is a lot of uh, brands and also new brands. Uh, these brands are originally from uh, so-called internet companies. They start to also stepping into the field of EV vehicles and they contribute their ideas and uh, explanations about, you know, solutions uh, for comfort, uh, let's say, transportation solutions. But uh, consider there's more than 300 different brands at the moment in China, and everybody is, uh, you know, uh, announcing that uh, or, or showing that they have different ideas about EV vehicles. And uh, I don't see this is the only, this is the only one uh, transportation solutions for, for China or for the future. So what are the other options that China is looking at? Because um, if you look at the transportation world, let's see the, f the look backwards, more than 100 years, we only talk about the transportation on the 2D uh, world, only on the street. Doesn't matter if it's a four wheels, three wheels, two wheels, doesn't matter if it's EV, uh, motorbike, or bicycles. We are only talking about 2Ds. And uh, in China, we have so many people and limited streets, and also uh, when we talk about the urban mobility solutions back to uh, 2011, because we have this kind of research almost everywhere inside China, globally. Uh, I have been working for uh, the brand General Motors, and we find out actually the urban mobility uh, means different uh, individual uh, solutions for each country, you know, uh, under the different backgrounds. But if I look at the challenges that China has, and this is for all mega cities across the world, traffic management, exactly. for instance. Uh, personal ownership of cars is something which is now being uh, questioned with ride sharing uh, uh, options. Are we then going to see internal combustion engine cars being replaced by electric vehicles, but still the same gridlocks on, on the roads? Exactly. Or do you, see, do you see further transformation of how people use vehicles? I think uh, in nowadays, in, uh, instead of you think how you uh, convert the energy resource, which means uh, electric solutions for automotive, you know, field, maybe it's better that you think about the alternative uh, solutions for urban mobility, transportation, like uh, all the possibilities of public transportations and private-owned uh, transportations and last-mile solutions. 
but still there is a, a, a big dimension, uh, you know, uh, requirement or needs from the market that we are not offering yet, like 3D, you know, transportation, like flying um, vehicles or flying devices. Well, is there a vision? I don't know. Maybe there's a vision that you know these little drones will pick us up and take us from place to place. That could be one of the uh, ideas that people would look at. But this is a this is a time when we're experimenting with some completely new ideas which have not been thought of. Uh, Wolf, I'd like to come to you. You are a leader in steering systems. Do you see a need for steering systems in the future? Well, in ZF, we have the vision to create the mobility of the next generation. And uh, we have to, we have to reinvent our company because otherwise with uh, transmissions where we are coming from, which is still one third of our business, we will probably not survive. So we have created uh, uh, this, this vision, next generation mobility, and we are nailing it down into, into packages. Uh, I want the future to be safe, number one. And that is no accidents anymore. Today we have a couple of hundred thousand fatalities on the roads in the world. So we support the vision zero of the FIA and with our safety systems we are working on that there are no accidents anymore and automatization will help us a lot. The next is efficiency and efficiency first of all and, and mobility means how can we prevent mobility? Yeah. How can we make it more efficient that we have less vehicles on the road and less transportation means yeah, looking at a broader scale on the road? Yeah? That would be disruptive. And the other one what would be really disruptive, it's not for me the electric uh, propulsion system. That is just a change of the, of the motor. But if we really drive automatic, so ZF uh, together with a partner will launch this year a fully automatic robotaxi and we will go to serial production next year. And that is a vehicle that pick you up, picks you up at home in the, in the beginning in restricted areas yeah, because the complexity of cities is still too big. Yeah, and we have to evolve the technology, but in restricted areas, we will pick you up, for example, in a plant yeah, from the parking place and, and, and uh, drive you to your, to, your, to your office or to your working space. Yeah. And with this, really trying to generate uh, something that is disruptive. Let's take a, a poll on this, uh, and I'll ask uh, the, the uh, team to set up the questions. Which transportation technology will be most impactful in the future? And the, and the Three or four options are autonomous land vehicles, autonomous aerial vehicles, hyperloop transportation, space travel, or something else that we haven't even thought of. So uh, please, please um, keep your um, voting on, and perhaps towards the end of the session, we'll see what the uh, results are. But coming to all three of you, is there a larger vision for transportation that the world is missing? Are we still looking at it in pieces, electric vehicles, or perhaps hyperloop? Is there a larger theory or concept that we have not looked at, whether it's from safety point of view, whether it's from efficiency point of view, whether it's from the climate impact? Um, it still seems to a lot of people that we are tinkering with, with existing ideas, but a larger vision for transportation is perhaps missing. Would, would, Dirk, would you like to uh, respond to this? So, well, I would say that <clears throat> they are being looked at. Right, they're not being imp they're not implemented yet. Um, there's, I mean, first of all, right now the different modalities don't talk to each other, mm -hmm. right? So we have a concept um, that we call the naked passenger, and the naked passenger, you know, he's naked, so he needs to be moved as fast as possible in a seamless way. He's naked. He doesn't have a cell phone. He doesn't have his wallet. He still needs to be transported. So that's, I think that's the closest that we can get to probably teletransport, right? If you don't have to wait anymore, if everything around you works and happens automatically. Technology is great when you don't really feel that it's there. So, um, you know, here in St. Gallen, not, but uh, like I use Uber, Lyft in LA fairly regular. My mom doesn't. She, you know, she has a smartphone, but she would never probably use an app to call an Uber. Mm -hmm. So there's still a barrier. There's, uh, it doesn't work automatically. It doesn't work for everybody. And um, that's, that's a big part that needs to happen. So everything needs to play together. Everything ideally works on one platform. 
everything is concentrated on the passenger. Um, and automated, like if my train is late, maybe I get, um, I, I, you know, I get an alert somewhere that, hey, over there, there is a ZF uh, robotic uh, shuttle that can get you there still in time. Um, so literally making it something that's completely um, intermodal, optimized, and that's doable today. That's not about using a future, in, uh, using, using technology in the future. You can do this today. The biggest part that we're missing in a lot of these elements is actually the transportation today um, doesn't really make sense. Like, it's not profitable. It's, um, you know, car companies make money, but roads are still paid through taxes, for example. And it's uh, one of the biggest issues that we're tackling when we go after the railroads. Railroads, in general, I mean, there's no railway, no metro line in the whole world that's profitable. They're all relying heavily on government subsidies, but that doesn't need to be like that. It's like that because it's, uh, you know, put on the government and, uh, you know, they might not be the best ones to come up with innovative and new systems. There hasn't really been any innovation in mobility, re real change for the last 50 years. Now we're, I think we're in exciting times because over the last, I would say four or five years, things are changing, right? You're talking a lot about mobility. There's a, there's a lot that's going to change in the future. And I loved, by the way, the, in the video, the part of uh, the students where it was like in a developed country, rich people take public transport because I agree. Travel, transportation should be better and it should be something that makes more sense than sitting by yourself in the car. That's, that's a good point. Let's take a look at the results of the poll and we'll come back to it a little uh, later. Um, we're going to put it up in a second. So autonomous land vehicles are likely to have the most impact. More than half the uh, audience thinks so. Uh, Hyperloop, I think, is still 13%, so maybe you need to work on the marketing, uh, uh, Dirk. Um, space travel. Um, I don't know whether if I want to go from India to Switzerland, do I have to go via space? I'm not sure about that yet. But it's, it's exciting. And autonomous vehicles, both uh, Will and you and, and uh, Wolf, that's something that's going to impact both of you. Is this, again, a, a fantasy? Because half of the world uh, lives in areas where cities cannot possibly have uh, autonomous driving. You know, in, in my part of the world, even though there are humans in the car, people think that they're driving on their own. So um, how, do you, how do you see this autonomous vehicle trend developing in China? Do you think that's, that's a reality? That's a possibility? It's definitely been the direction I think everybody is already confirmed about. But uh, personally, I'm not really uh, optimistic uh, within the next 15 years that we can make this really true or because there's a lot of, uh, you know, issues and problems that we need to solve first. So, uh, talking so what about... Would be the, what would be the biggest problem that you have to solve first? Uh, for example, infrastructures or law regulations and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, other things. And how would you, for example... Uh, would there be only the autonomous driving cars, vehicles on the road, or you, 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 how you can define the different roads for the, for the combustion vehicles or human still driving the vehicles? How you define these? And by the regulation, by the laws, how the insurance company paid in, uh, in terms of accident happens, you know, a lot of things, and uh, still we don't know. Sure. Yeah, and... Wolf, this is the perception that these will have the most impact, but does the industry also think so? Or does the industry think that something else is going to be more impactful, we just don't know it yet? Well, first of all, it's a dream, and, and we will realize it for certain areas, but it will not be the so solution for the world. Last year I was in India, and again I was very uh, uh, excited by the way of driving in Indian cities, and uh, an autonomous vehicle would just sit there sends around and stop and not move. <laughs> yeah. Because it wants to respect all rules, all distances and everything, and that's not possible yeah, in, in, in uh, crowded cities uh, around the world. It, yeah. it will need multi-sensory perception. <laughs> yeah. and, and a different driving style that is not legal. <laughs> yeah. So it is not the solution. The other thing is even, even for Western cities, there are certain uh, limitations. If we realize these robotaxis, 
taxis, they will take away uh, the, uh, the people from public transport because it's much more convenient. It's much nicer than if such a vehicle picks you up at, uh, in front of your door and gets you in front of the door you want to go. The people won't use public transport if it's affordable. That would lead to more congestion. Yeah, so we would have even more traffic jams. Yeah. So uh, it also relates to your first question. What we need is really new concepts for cities where governments and mobility providers work together. And this is happening in the last years. I agree what Dirk said. But we are far not there in having any kind of solutions. Yeah. We, we have to think very hard and uh, getting all the uh, sectors together and come up with a holistic picture yeah, I hope that in the next few years we come up with better ideas, but so far there are, there are no good uh, solutions uh, where we could say that's the way. There, there is concept of intelligent transport systems, which I know European Union is investing a lot in, but I don't think anybody has found the final configuration. But let's take some thoughts and questions from, from the audience uh, about where the future lies. Uh, can we have some mics in the audience, please? <coughs> right. Uh, a mic over here, um, Mr. Jalan. By the way, I hope you guys are wrong. <laughs> because, I think, I think you know, we need autonomous mics as well. Like, even so, the regulations are not there yet. It's uh, definitely, I mean, it's proven that uh, autonomous driving saves lives. Sure. So not, well, not, implementing, not implementing it means that we are continue killing people that, you know, should survive. I think uh, uh, the question is, you have to ask the rest, right question in the right moment. I was saying that uh, autonomous drive is definitely the future. The direction is not wrong, but in terms of what we are going to do within these 15 years, we're not only waiting and how we develop our traffic situation, for example. This is uh, dramatic problems in China, like big mega city in Beijing, in Shanghai. I think it's always connected to uh, economics. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Exactly. And but perhaps politics, as you said. Yeah, but that goes hand in hand because the moment that the government realizes that they can save a bunch of money by implementing something, they will. And, um, you know, and that's, that's, that's something that even in India will happen, right? And they can enforce certain things as well. Look, I, I was in Italy for 14 years. <laughs> and when I arrived, they were driving terrible. Like, you wouldn't see, you wouldn't see a guy wearing a seatbelt. And I would have said, it's never, ever going to happen. In fact, when they put the law to wear a seatbelt, the Italians in Neapol, they printed a shirt with a seatbelt on it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you go there today. But that's the brightest concept in transportation in a while. <laughs> but you go there today, it's changed completely. Right. They're not going over at anymore, at least in the north, um, because it was enforced, right? So. But don't get me wrong, we will realize the safety before the full autonomous vehicle will come. Yeah? Because this you can also realize if you still have a driver uh, there. Yeah? But the sensors are already uh, in place and we have to make them a commodity. Because an Indian car or a Brazilian car doesn't, doesn't have a single of those sensors. Yeah? Here in uh, Europe, in Switzerland, yeah? cars break already auto automatically before they enter into a crash. Yeah? And this will evolve must fa much faster then we see the real autonomous driving in, a, in an urban environment. Yeah? So it's a step-by-step -step approach, but I agree with you. Safety is number one. And that will but you know what's happening in, in emerging markets? Ride-sharing is allowing more organization of, of transport, which will allow you to implement rules and regulations in a far more e effective way. So I see there is a possibility, but you're right. I think preparing for the change is more important, and that includes both our, our mentally as well as in a regulatory uh, system. I, th I think there's a key component missing, and sorry for whoever wants to ask the question, I just want to get this in here. Because um, I work with a lot of car manufacturers here in Europe as well. And the, the technology, I mean, you know, first of all, the development is exponential. So right now in Silicon Valley, or actually everywhere in the world, if you are an engineer and you think you're, you're, you, you hold something on yourself, you work on autonomous vehicles. And that's great, right? So we see a lot of development there. The implementation, like the moment that self-driving cars arrive, I, I, I agree, it might take a while until they get anywhere. But the component that's not seen is the moment that that's free, right? So if I solve the monetary aspects and I don't need to buy 
that autonomous vehicle because it makes economic sense because there's a different business model. There's nobody in India that's going to have their own car. They're all going to use that one because they don't need to pay for it, right? And that's a shift. And that's something that you know, a lot of people might not... Really transport as, as a paid service rather than an owner-driven uh, activity. But uh, questions, uh, Mr. Jalan, and I'd, any other questions in the back? Uh, I'll come to you. Please, go ahead, sir. I have a surmise we are not letting our imaginations fly. Just take yourself back 300 years back. How many of us would have thought that we would be flying an aircraft? Can't we think far ahead if you go by old books, mythologies in various regions, there is a kind of flying which is just sitting on your desk, you pop, uh, suppose where you want to be and you will reach there. So it's not something which is practical at the moment, but hundreds of years, I think that's where the future will be. There can be a time machine, there can, why can't there be a distance machine? Can we think on those lines? Beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for this line. Anybody else? That's a great thought. Uh, uh, anybody else? With, uh, I see two hands at the back. Um, yeah, please. Do introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is uh, Akash. I run a company called Grey Orange uh, in India. Uh, we have been all talking about um, you know, distributed decision making. So whether we talk about us as drivers or autonomous cars. But I haven't heard um, talking about central autonomous systems where, let's say, a group of cars enter a certain region, which is centrally controlled, and then decision making is uh, done by a central system. Maybe that orchestration will be far better than uh, distributed de uh, uh, decision making that we are looking at right now by a driver as a human being or autonomous car. So are we? Kind of looking at that uh, model as well, or uh, not that, really? I think that's a, that's an interesting concept. Would any of you like to respond to this, where somebody else is driving the car? There's one person with with the button, and there are a million cars moving. Um, so you know, does that scare you, or is that a possibility? Is that a practical idea? Well, we had we had such concepts uh, discussed a couple of years ago, uh, be before we came to the point that. Uh, uh, with, with supercomputing, we, we can manage the vehicle with, uh, on its own. Uh, the earlier idea was, is there a center, is there even a new re remote driver? Yeah? That you have a large driving center yeah? and uh, the driver is not anymore in the vehicle yeah? and then you maneuver it from a center. Uh, why wasn't it realized and why, were, why are we going now for the autonomous vehicle also in that sense that we have the intelligence in, in the cloud and in the vehicle because Getting all the people together and the authorities and the legal thing takes longer than we expect that the technology evolves to make other systems run. That was the assessment, and that's why we try to do it the faster way. There was a, a person right next to you. Right, thank you. Thank you all for taking the time. Uh, Ryan Pila, digital strategy consultant uh, and graduate at NYU Stern School of Business. I'm curious, it seems like we talk a lot about uh, personal transportation, obviously because it's relevant and sexy to us, but there's, I think that's sort of small in comparison to uh, like global supply chain. So are we looking at, and I'm curious what your guys' opinion is, the future of um, transportation, trucking, are we looking at sort of full EV fleets or are supply um, shipping routes going to be replaced by Hyperloop? So I'd love to get your take. Good point. Doug, would you like to take this? Yeah, actually, it's, a, it's an important part. I mean, in our case, it's an important part of our business model. I know by fact that most of the car manufacturers are looking at it as well. Um, it's about, uh, again, creating distributed systems. It's about using existing infrastructure that's already there. Um, public transport systems, right? So why can't goods be transported using the metro lines that are already there, for example? Um, there's a problem when, you come, when it comes to inner cities that people are getting more and more uh, picky about what goes in there. They don't want to the garbage truck to be noisy, they don't want uh, the, I mean, the trucks that brings the beer to rattle the bottles and, uh, you know, all of these issues are there and they're being looked at. Drones are already being tested for a lot of the supply chain part and I think it's a mix of everything, right? It's really about um, 
how can you optimize it is actually one of the biggest problems that we have right now because most of the trucks and most of the containers are inef inefficient, they are, they are half empty. So Hyperloop itself, uh, we just opened up our logistic hub, um, our ExoSquare, our innovation hub for logistics in Brazil to solve many of these issues or at least to try to solve them. Uh, Hyperloop itself, of course, has a lot of use cases um, and the biggest one or the biggest impact for probably would be the Silk Road, which is a project uh, pushed forward by the Chinese government um, to connect Europe to China. And uh, in the case of Hyperloop, that would happen within hours rather than within weeks, right? So you are now able to get small amounts of goods much faster, which would completely change the way that we manufacture, change the way, like creating an on-demand economy, basically. Is the possibility of drones becoming important for passenger movement? Um, smaller, essentially smaller autonomous aerial vehicles, you, it can stop you know, from here to our hotel back, it could pop us over there. Is that, is that uh, perhaps any of you have thought of that? Is that something being considered? Well, it's, uh, I mean, there's a problem with, past, with, with adoption, right? Mm -hmm. So I feel at least. And uh, at the end, we already have flying cars. They're called uh, helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, they're, they're maybe a little bit more expensive, but at the end, um, you know, it's, it's still a little bit an issue, I think. Um, but I think it's, they can overcome it. So but that's the problem there is. But, a you know, the, the, the complexity in air is slower than, than on ground. I mean, uh, airplanes can, in, in full fog situations, can automatically land and, and take off. Yeah? So automatization is already there. Mm -hmm. yeah? You still have the pilot, but he's not doing anything. He's just sort of supervising. And there are now the first flying taxis in Dubai uh, tested yeah, with, with personal helicopters yeah, that are also auton autonomous. Yeah? So that exists, but I think the public acceptance will not be there. Yeah, who wants it in a nice city like St. Gallen have a lot of these things uh, uh, swirling around? Yeah? And uh, I think that is at least in crowded areas like Europe or, or East Coast and West Coast, probably the, the, the bigger thing, yeah, that there's no acceptance for traffic up in the air. No, but in a city like London or New York, where it can take you know, hours to get from one end to the other, it might not be a bad idea. Uh, Except if you're hundred of those things running over your house. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, the reason why uh, European have uh, or Americans have different point of view is because of this environment we got used to. For example, uh, regarding to the EV autos, I, I see in Europe or, or even in States there are not uh, urgency need for developing these cars. But in China, the reason for that is we have. Uh, for, um, for example, the environment issues, traffic issue, which is terrible. I don't know ever uh, any of you guys in Europe have ever experienced in the mid of the night, there's still traffic jam in third ring, fourth ring, fifth ring, and sixth ring in Beijing. You're stuck somewhere and you are not, uh, you, you don't know when you are able to reach home, even there's only three kilometers ahead. So these issues uh, create a really urgency uh, solution for, for the urban transportation. I'm talking about Beijing as a mega city. Probably the, the concept of mega city is different from uh, what you understand in Europe. Let's see. We have in Beijing now the seventh ring. The second ring is 37 kilometers. The, sec uh, the, the third ring is 48. Fourth ring is 50 something, and the fifth is 67 kilometers, and the seventh, you can imagine, is now bigger as 940 kilometers, the wow. ring road of city Beijing. So you see, uh, this is a way we solve the problem. The system and the construction is so much different and I don't see autonomous, even in 15 years, will solve the transportation issues. And from now on to then, we still have so much time on what we do about the transportation. And also in, in Beijing, there is a policy. We have very limited uh, options for number plates that you can, you can get to buy cars. In Beijing, for example, each year you have 150,000 number plates 
And you only can have this by number plate lottery, you know. Maybe you're lucky enough you get a number plate, you can buy cars. Regardless, this is the EV cars or combustion cars. And 50, 40 of them are EV cars. Means, for example, 2018 this year, at the very beginning of this year, we are already run out of the, all the number plates. But this doesn't solve the issue of traffic jam. And we are talking about uh, autonomous drive, we are talking about human intelligence, ER, VR, uh, this stuff, what we can do in the car. But the core business of transportation is always efficiency as quick, quick as possible from A to B, right? The reason we are talking about intelligence, also autonomous driver, is perhaps at the moment, nowadays, we are not able to solve the traffic issues because uh, the industry is still selling the cars one, one by one, you know, day and tomorrow. Sure. So the thing is, we have to... I, I, I get that. I think what's, what's, what I'll, we'll have to conclude here because the next part of the plenary will begin and let, perhaps I would request the results to be out and see if there's any shift in thinking in the audience after uh, what you said that, you know, autonomous driving is, is still a while away. Um, I think what is really clear is two things from, from this uh, discussion. A, that we're still missing a big concept, a transformative concept in transportation uh, globally. B, which is slightly paradoxical, that no one solution can apply. Sengalan's need and Beijing's need are clearly very different. Um, similarly, what's happening in, in different continents, the transportation needs will change. Uh, you cannot think of a concept which perhaps will work uh, in one town or in one country which will be equally applicable. However, I guess what we can conclude on is that preparing for a new idea, getting people ready in terms of thinking, regulatory landscape, uh, long-term vision for politicians and, and leaders who have to take the decisions that there is an urgency for solving the transportation needs. Hopefully, some new technology in the recent, uh, uh, in, in, in the near future could perhaps give us an answer. But thank you so much for joining us this afternoon.